I'm here with Rachel Held Evans. Rachel is a New York Times bestselling author whose books include Faith Unraveled, A Year of Biblical Womanhood, and Searching for Sunday. Hailing from Dayton, Tennessee, home of the famous Scopes Monkey Trial of 1925, she writes about faith, doubt, and life in the Bible Belt. Rachel has been featured in the Washington Post, The Guardian, Christianity Today, Slate, The Huffington Post, The CNN Belief Blog, and on NPR, The BBC, The Today Show, and The View. Rachel also served as keynote speaker at the inaugural Frederick Buechner's Writers Workshop at Princeton Seminary. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure. As you know, Mr. Beekner will soon be turning 90 years old. Is there anything you'd like to wish him for this great milestone? Oh. Well, I consider myself a Beek nerd. I don't know if you've heard of us, but um, I'm so grateful for all of Mr. Beekner's work. And I guess I would wish him just the happiest of birthdays, and I hope he's surrounded by family and friends and good food, good words, uh, and that um, he continues to have um, a sense of joy and presence uh, in the months and years to come. Uh, we just celebrate with him here in the Evans home all the way in Dayton, Tennessee, and wish him many more. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. I'm sure Mr. Beacon will greatly appreciate hearing from you. Next, can you tell me how you first learned of his work? Oh, well, with, with Beekner, it's kind of like you know when you learn a new word and then all of a sudden you see it used over and over again uh, you know maybe you read it in a book but then you hear it on TV and then you see it on the hear it on the radio it was kinda like that for me where I I think the first time I ever read any of his words was in the inscription at the beginning of um, a prayer for Owen Meany which is one of my favorite uh, books of all, novels of all time John Irving and it was the quote about how um, if there was no room for doubt, there would be no room for me, talking about faith. And I remember underlining that and trying to figure out who this guy was who had written those words. And then just a few weeks later, a, a very dear friend of ours died suddenly. He was like a second father to me. And at the funeral, uh, someone read the very famous uh, Listen to Your Life quote. Uh, and there was that name again, Frederick Wigner. And I realized then that I really had to track this guy down. So I think the first book I read, I think, was, they kind of all bleed together in my mind because it's like, you know, you go and you think, where did this, where was this quote? I remember this story, I remember this quote, and you can't remember what book it was. But I think the first one I read was Telling the Truth. Uh, and then I started talking to my writer friends about what I'd found, and they were all like, yeah, we've been on to Frederick Wigner for a while now. Like, welcome to the club. So <laughs> I was a little late to the party, I think, but... Uh, it was a few little breadcrumbs uh, that led me to his work. That's great, Rachel. I think that that's not too unusual, uh, what you described. <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> what would you say most attracts you to Mr. Beekner's writing? Well, I think um, there's a quote, and I wrote it down in Listen to Your Life, uh, where he, it's in Secrets in the Dark. Uh, there's a quote in Secrets in the Dark where he says, Faith and fiction both involve the concrete, the earthen, the particular more than they do the abstract and the cerebral. And I think that's what I appreciate most about his writing is that it's concrete and it's earthen and it's particular. And when people write about faith, there's always this sort of tendency to, to float off into abstractions and get overly cerebral. And we all know he could have done that because he's super smart <laughs> and uh, one of the greatest thinkers of our time. And yet every word is so rooted and grounded in actual life. And so I appreciate that not just as a writer, but also as a person of faith who's always looking to understand what does my faith mean to my senses? You know, how can I touch and taste and feel and smell this? Uh, I don't want to just talk about the kingdom of God like it's out there. I want to talk about what does it mean? Um, like Bigner did this, you know, instead of talking about church, he would talk about the friend who drove many miles to come and see him when his daughter was sick and he was stressed out. And you know, it's it's putting uh, flesh on what it means to be a person of faith and a Christian and what it means to be part of the kingdom and, and part of the church. And so I guess I just I appreciate the earthen concrete nature of his writing and 
of his faith, and it's been a huge inspiration to me. I think in a lot of ways he, he gave so many people permission to doubt and permission to write about doubt um, and also to write about sadness, I guess. Um, I think there's sometimes a tendency in faith circles to think that if you're going to write about faith, it always has to be inspirational and like a positive, upbeat, hope around every corner sense. And um, I appreciate that he looks at life so in such a straightforward, honest way. And that gave me permission to do that in my life and in my writing. I think it probably especially influenced Searching for Sunday because Searching for Sunday is a book I wrote about church. And I wanted to write about church in a way that avoided sentimentality on the one hand, um, but cynicism on the other. I didn't want to fall into one of those two traps, which we kind of tend to do. And so I feel like his work is, ha, has consistently displayed that ability to be brutally honest about all that is lovely and all that is ugly and all that is complicated and beautiful uh, and interesting and true about the life of faith and about church. And that's what I wanted reflected in Searching for Sunday. So I, in, in that sense, he certainly has been an example to me. So of Mr. Beaker's many books, uh, do you have any in particular that you would say stand out that have meant most to you? No, because like I was saying before, it's like I'll, I'll, I'll remember, oh, I read there was a story or Beaker said something about this passage, and then it's like I have to comb through like all of the books to try and figure out where it was. And so it's sort of like there's a pieces from each volume, whether it was a collection of his sermons, collection of essays, um, that have meant something important to me. So it's really, I can never pin down one book because half the time I don't know where I originally <laughs> read whatever it is that is sticking with me or that I've recalled in a moment, um, which I suppose speaks to his, uh, the prolific nature <laughs> of his writing. So more broadly speaking, what influence would you say that Mr. Peters had on Christianity and the world at large? Mm -hmm. Well, like I was saying before, I, I really think that the the permission to doubt is a big one. Um, I mean, at the throughout his writing, you see this just brutal honesty about what the faith experience is actually like for so many of us. And as somebody who's you know, a writer in Christian publishing, uh, I've often felt that that part of my experience was unwelcome um, in church or in publishing or um, in the culture at large. And so when you find somebody who's writing about doubt in such an honest and compelling and thoughtful way as part of faith, not as something that's in opposition to faith, it's incredibly freeing. And I think that most of the people I know who are also beak nerds and who love his work uh, say they love it for a lot of reasons, but the one I hear most often is because it gave me permission to doubt and or permission and permission to talk about my doubts honestly, uh, so that we weren't just kind of sweeping them under the rug and pretending like they weren't a part of our experience. So I think that that's a pretty pretty big deal. I would totally agree. <laughs> I realize this next question is difficult, but if you were to sum up Fred's writing in a few words, what would you say? Um, I know you said that one ahead of time, and I was like, ooh, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, I don't know. I, I guess generous is a word that comes to mind, um, just not simply because of the just, you know, the prolific nature of his writing, um, but also with how generous he was with his own story and his own experiences, which as a writer, I understand uh, does cost something sometimes and that it's not easy to sort of bleed all over the page like he often did. And uh, so, yeah, generous is a word that comes to mind. Um, and also kind. I, I don't know Mr. Wigner. It sometimes feels like I do. But... Um, I know that he placed a high value on kindness, and uh, one of my favorite quotes ever, one I use in Searching for Sunday is, uh, if you want to be holy, be kind. And so I know that kindness was a value that he had, and it's one that I'm, as I get older, I'm appreciating more and more. Somebody once said, 
when I was young, I valued people who were clever, but now that I am old, I value people who are kind. Uh, and so I appreciate his leading the way in, in that regard. So generous and kind are two words that come to mind. Excellent. That's wonderful. So Rachel, this has been great. Uh, before we finish, is there anything else that you'd like to pass along? Um, no, just gratitude for um, Mr. Beekner's generosity of spirit and the example uh, his writing has been for me and the inspiration it's been for me. I'm incredibly thankful and it's just it's an incredible honor to be a part of something like this um, given uh, just how much this work has meant to me. Happy birthday!